And when I say a mind fuck, I mean it. A mind fuck. Hello guys, welcome, or if you've already seen my channel before, welcome back. I am the Philadelphia Whovian, and if you've never seen my channel before, you don't know this, but for those of you who have seen it before, you do know that when it comes to my channel, every now and again, I have the beautiful fortune of my viewers, every so often, recommending a TV show, oh, sorry from sweating, it's been, it's a really hot day, okay, hot day, you're going to see me sweat some more, it's just going to happen, <laughs> sorry guys, take two and see, okay, my viewers every now and again recommend TV shows for me to watch that I did not know existed in one form or another, and every now and again I get the beautiful fortune to be able to actually access it and buy it here in America, now you're thinking, huh? Why would it be hard for her? Because it is. Every now and again, my viewers recommend a beautiful show for me to watch. It's exciting. Then I go online, I find that there are only region two or four copies of it. There are no copies that are made to be viewed here in America. No region one copies. So I'm sitting there, looking at my computer, contemplating the painful fact that this is probably a great show. I cannot see. Ouch! 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 But luckily, that was not the case with this one. I thought it would be. I thought with all my um, history at not being able to find Region 1 copies of shows that they rec people recommend to me, I would definitely not find this one. But somebody recommended this show to me, and I went on eBay and click on the, you can say, Bob's Your Uncle, I found Region 1 copies of it. Different collections of Region 1 copies, by the way. And then I had a hard time finding which one I should buy. So the person who recommended it here on YouTube went on eBay, found it for me, the right copy to buy, and to purchase. And about a couple weeks ago, a magical moment happened. Where? In the mail. There it is. The prisoner. The prisoner. Yes. I got it. And this is set one, I believe, where it includes the episodes of the pilot story, Arrival, and also an alternate version of The Chimes of Big Ben, Free for All, and Dance of the Dead. So first four episodes. I was told that this was something that was like mind, like mind blowing. And it was. Okay, I'm going to give you the brief synopsis of it. What we got here is basically, I mean, it shows you right there in the opening credits. Oh, before I continue, best opening sequence ever. 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 Literally. Because the story opens with um, the character, again, we don't, not met with his, we're not kind of given his name when we first meet him, but he's driving along in his car through London, goes into his office, and when he opens the doors, the thunder crashes, and it's like the the lighting is dark, so thunder crashes while he opens the door. He storms into the office of clear one of his bosses or higher ups, and he resigns, and it's all in silence, like there's no dialogue, just music, but you see it with the visuals. He hands in his letter of resignation, and it shows that he is resigned. He goes back home, then sleeping gas goes through his door to knock him out, and he is kidnapped by some people who were stalking him. He wakes up in a village, and when I say village, I mean like a town. Sorry, it's some parts of the world, village does not mean town, it means like village where, back in classic times, village. So, I have to clarify that for certain people. Village, which is like a nice like little town slash resort type of place. He wakes up and he is not, there's no knowledge, he's no knowledge of where he is and no one around him is giving him any information of where he is. He goes into a shop to ask for a map and the map doesn't even show where he is. It just says with everything going around it, your village and everything outside the village is the mountains. He, and also he's in a taxi in the very beginning to get out of this village to go to the nearest town, but it's only the local service, and he's not able to get out of this village at all. And it turns out he was kidnapped and brought there because, and I've only seen the first four episodes, so if they eventually he's revealed who has kidnapped him, I'm not there yet. He was kidnapped by people who orchestrated this entire town to bring people there 
to new, had information or new information that they wanted to get out of them. So basically it's like, you know, when you see a spy be kidnapped and tortured for information, it's like that. But this is different. This is them using psychological and mental mind games to completely disorient the person, to knock them off their kilter and eventually make them break. And they, if you are expendable, if they don't really care that much about you, sorry, it's wet. If they don't care much about um, you after they get the information, they might have no hesitancy, hesitancy with killing you. But they can also, if you do cooperate and they want, they need you afterwards, they can reassign you. But either way, he wakes up, the lead character wakes up in this world, and in the first four episodes, it's about them psychologically De deconstructing him and breaking him down using every ounce of trickery they can to wear him down and eventually get him to leak the information that he knows about. And I can't even, I don't want to tell you too much about the show because I don't want to spoil it for you if you want to see it. But they go about it, this village, and the people who orchestrate the village go about it in ways that are just so out there. It's not simple torture. This is something else. This is just a whole new level of mind warping terror. Terror. Hard word for me to say sometimes. That R at the very end is not easy for me. Okay, it comes to the prisoner. I mean, look at that face. That face says secret agent, doesn't it? That is Patrick McGugan. And Patrick McGugan, oh, he just looks like an agent. I mean, talk about looking like you're a part. He does a great job in this. I believe he's also the executive producer of the show, but I could be wrong. And he shouts out at the end, or near the end of the first episode, I am not a number. I am a free man. What that means is, by the end of the episode, he's called number six. The reason why is because he lives in house number six. So you are named after the house or the area that you live in. So he's called number six. He's like, I am not a number. I am a free man. And that's a beautiful moment. So how can I sum up this story or sum up this show? It is James Bond meets Alice in Wonderland meets... Coraline the movie or it's Doctor Who meets Secret Agent Man meets High Rise except it's way better than High Rise no offense to those people who might like the movie High Rise I admit okay the, the acting is amazing all the actors in the movie High Rise was absolutely amazing the directing was absolutely amazing the cinematography was amazing and so was the costume design but the storytelling was god awful and a complete mess and it was a pretentious piece of crap if you like it no problem that's you and yes I know it was based on a book okay I know still I'm sticking to what I feel about the film if people want to know my feelings about it, please, I, I don't I don't want to do a review on it. I'll do it if you keep on nagging me, but I, I don't want to do a re review on High Rise. Back to the story. But I mean, like, it's that in the sense that you've got the James Bond sort of character, secret agent man, pretty much. I think he even played the secret agent man. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Patrick McDugan, McGugan wakes up in this place, he wakes up in this world completely, where everything feels completely bonkers, and he has to get through this world, but at the same time, it's what I call the beauty of a style where it's different but familiar. For those people who watch Doctor Who, Doctor Who for the longest time lived under this rule of where if you want to be really successful when you do things this out there, things have to be different, but they always have to have a feeling of familiarity to them. And that's what the prisoner does. It's different, very different, but it's also very familiar. And I believe that this was even called like television's first masterpiece. I think it kind of is, because it does things in a way that I never would have foreseen a show in the 1970s or any time period for a long time doing a show in this way, where you take simply a spy or a spy show and give it such a twist where the spy wakes up, spy is in prison, or his prison is his whole village, where certain people, they orchestrate the entire village to the point where they can control people, where if they say stop, everybody will stop in the area, but not him. It's just so, whoa, and in the third episode where they put him under the sort of mind warp where he runs for office trying get him to, to break him and bend to the wheel by getting him to run for office, like, 
Who thought of that? Jesus! Whoa, that was incredible. Mm -hmm. And also, with um, the last one, Dance of the Dead. Okay, in each episode, we have someone called Number Two. Number Two is the one who kind of runs everything, overlooks everything. And each episode, Number Two is played usually by a different actor, almost. And my favorite number two is in Dance of the Dead. I believe number two was played by an actress named Mary Morris. Oh my god, she was incredible. Okay, I call her a white, non-American version of Eartha Kitt. If you don't know Eartha Kitt, sucks to be you. Eartha Kitt is, was iconic once upon a time, and she was... I love that woman. But literally, Mary Morris reminds me of a white version of Eartha Kitt. And she has that just ability to, this coolness, this calmness, to disorient, to make you disorientated. <laughs> you know, completely knock you off your socks. She does it in a way that it's like, whoa. And at the very end of it, when they have her in the Peter Pan costume for the fancy dress carnival, it's like, what the freak? What? And then it comes also down to... The direction. Okay, when it comes to The Arrival, Patch starring Patch and McGugan, I should give some guest stars with this one. Oh, God, do I even remember the guest stars? I'll do my best. Guest star, I believe, Virginia Maskell. Also, Guy Dolman. I think Paul Eddington. And George Baker, I believe. And I believe it was The Arrival, the very first episode, which is one of the best opening episodes of a TV show I've ever seen. I believe it was George Markstein who wrote it, but he also was the script editor. That, But I think it was also co-written by a person named David Tombin, who I believe also produced it. And it was directed by Don Chafee, or Chaffee. I believe Chafee. Sorry, bad with names. Very, very bad with names. But the direction, oh my gosh, the direction of all four of these episodes, okay, the direction of the arrival was God-smackingly beautiful. It was incredible. But the direction for every episode was very beautiful. The writing for each episode was very beautiful of these four stories. The only setback for me when it came to this set was the chimes of Big Ben. And that was the only disappointment. But not because of the episode. The episode itself was great. The reason why is because... The Prisoner was digitally remastered, and it was remastered very well. Like, literally, who, the remastering of this was very good. The, whoever worked on this to remaster it made sure the color was great, the lighting was great, and the audio was very easy to understand. There was also English subtitles to this, which I'm happy about. Not because their actors were unclear. The actors were very clear. It's just always nice to have subtitles so you can always make sure you heard exactly what you thought you heard. I wish more of the um, BBC shows I've seen sometimes had American subtitles to it because some of them have, you know, of course, British colloquialism and, and British slang that I admit, as an American, you can make fun of me all you want to and say I'm an idiot, but no, it's just simply a different culture. I don't always know the, the correct slang. So it's like whenever sometimes they're using a slang term or colloquial term in Britain, I'm like, wait, what exactly is that term? I hope I'm guessing it's what I think it is what I think it is, but I could be wrong. Either way, the directing is spellbinding, watching it. You know, every now and again, there are TV shows like American Gods and all that who really go for that out there, you know, avant-garde, just extreme, just artistic. Sorry, there's a car going off in the back of me. Extreme type of style. The Prisoner did that before they all did that. The Prisoner did it also very well to me personally. And I mentioned this story when I was at work. And when I was at work, there were two men who were they, they, from that generation where they saw it. By the way, this show took place in the 1970s, I believe. This is when the show aired. I could be wrong, though. In fact, I'm probably very, 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 very wrong. Probably definitely in the 1970s. In fact, screw that. I'm probably totally, totally wrong. It probably debuted in the 60s. Wait, hold on. Oh, I think it did. 1968, I think. Hold on, let me check. Yes, 1968. It's a 60s show. Whoa, very good. This is the 60s. Sorry. This is incredible. But yes, I think that when it comes to The Prisoner, it's a show that all those movies that are out there, they are just so like, whoa. That was a mind fuck, but it was a mind fuck in the good way. In the good way. 
the prisoner did it first. And sorry that I missed it in 1978. I think I mixed it up with a show that I'm also watching now called The Sandbaggers, which took place in 1978. That's why I thought it was 1978, because I'm watching both at the same time. So sorry that I got that wrong. It was 60s. But, oh my gosh, The Prisoner, I just did not know what I was in for when I watched it. Then I watched it, and it's like, that changed my life. And I could definitely say that I learned a lot watching this these four episodes, especially with the first story, The Arrival, and then also the fourth story, Dance of the Dead. I can definitely say I learned a lot, not only from an experience of getting more culture from TV, but also I learned a lot as a writer. The first episode, Arrival, and Dance of the Dead, and again, Chimes of Big Ben is an awesome episode, just wish it was remastered. I wish it was, it wasn't. Um, it will probably help me as a writer, because it's just so well written. But yes, that is my time with The Prisoner. And guys, have you seen The Prisoner? Have you not seen The Prisoner? Let me know if you have. Let me know if you haven't. But again, I'll reiterate what I said before. It is James Bond meets Alice in Wonderland meets Coraline the movie. Or Coraline the book. Either way, fuse those three things together and you've got The Prisoner. Just fuse them all together. It's the prisoner. And it was something that really rocked my socks up. And I'm happy that I did see it very much. And let you guys know now, um, I believe this week and next week I'm going to do three videos a week. But I will resume back to my two videos a week. Just because there are a lot of different subject matters that I have have to tackle in these next two weeks. Because I'm behind with things I should have been talking about. Like there's a video that I was supposed to do a part two on. For my, I did a, a while back, I did part one and then I never got around doing part two. Because I'm so behind in doing all these things and trying to do all my videos that, woo, gotta do more videos these next two weeks than I thought. And hopefully if I'm lucky I'll get around to doing uh, older videos I should get around to, but who knows, who knows. Lots of things to cover, so many subjects, so little time. But, till the next time friends, be seeing you, be seeing you. Bye guys.